lucky town, it's a place where dreams are found. We fought so many battles here, now we're the ones that they will fear. The cup resides within our town, we won't stop no letting down. The cup is ours for all to drink, it's our town, let's rock this ring. Yo, what is up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Hockey Town Rundown. You are here with us, your beautiful hosts, once again, Zach and Derek, with our special guest. Oh, he's on this side, Michael Rasmussen <laughs> and his boy, Jack. Derek, how's your weekend so far, buddy? I mean, buddy, it's going pretty well. We just got done watching the Lions destroy the Titans pretty aggressively there, so... I'm pretty hyped right now. I'm feeling good. It may be due to the fact that I had a couple little drinky poos during that game for the excitement, but everything's pretty good. For those of you that don't know, Derek and I, back in the college days, we would always play a game called Drinking Chell. I think Derek played uh, Drinking Lions. I don't even know what they call it. Every touchdown or point that they scored, he had to oh. take a drink. So he's a little weeble, weeble wobbly over here. Wow, the Sunday scaries are kicking in early today, Derek. But no, glad to hear that you enjoyed that win. That was a huge dub by the Lions, I would agree. And glad to see that Hendon Hooker got into play a little bit. Wish they utilized him a little bit more and some deep passes. But you take the victory. You take the W. W's in the chat, right, Derek? Dubs all day, buddy. That's all we needed from the Lions. Keep on going, God. We're going to be the Super Bowl, no world. <laughs> We're going to make it there. I Firmly believing it. Fingers crossed. And speaking of dubs, Derek, it's a dub today because we appreciate you guys for joining us once again if you are returning. But if you are new, that's an extra dub. We definitely appreciate you guys for coming on here, seeing what we have to offer. Why don't you go ahead, take a moment, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Doing those things are free, Derek. I'm not sure if you actually knew that yet, but wanted to let that be clear. You can also go ahead and leave us a comment letting us know what you think about the episode, your thoughts and opinions as well on what we talk about. We're going to be talking about what's working and what's not, mostly around the five-on-five -five aspect of the Detroit Red Wings. We're also on Spotify, and we're also on Apple Podcasts. Why don't you go ahead and hit that follow button or like button, I think it is. I just screwed that up. <laughs> why don't you go ahead and rate us five stars while you're at it as well. And Derek, why don't we go ahead and kick it off with some game notes. The Red Wings did play against the New York Islanders, winning 1-0 to zero with Alex Lyon in that. Going into the game, the Wings have the second most shots allowed per game, and the Isles have the second most shots on that per game. And that spells recipe for disaster because you went up against uh, Ilya Sorokin, uh, which is the complete opposite of what we said about the Isles being a defensive team since they outshot the Wings 8-2 to two in the first period alone, I believe was the final stat. But uh, the Red Wings were able to come out alive from Patrick Kane getting a nice pass from Tara Sank Show to make it that 1-0 game, which ended up being the game winner with their first shot after nine minutes without registering a shot, Derek. And uh, Alex Lyon with multiple amazing saves in the second period. He's absolutely a freak of nature, basically a freak of nature this whole entire game. But at the end of the day, the Red Wings were outshot 29-11, to which essentially lucky the Red Wings. But Lyon was on one. What would you think overall about this game, Derek? Great dub. I mean, it, it was a dub. That's for sure. Lion, outstanding. Everything else probably was the biggest snooze fest I've ever watched in a game. But then again, when do we ever expect New York Islanders to do anything different? Again, highly defensive team. We can see that out there. But they did produce a lot of shots and Lion stood strong. So I was really happy with Lion's production out there. But oh my God. That was probably the most boring hockey game I've watched in a long time. <laughs> 11 shots on it, which I'm pretty sure we ended the game with 10 shots and somehow someone gave us one extra. I think it was just a pity shot at the end of the day. Let's be honest. Yeah. Like they didn't want like, okay, they made the double digits. Let's give them one more just so they feel a little better. It didn't make me feel better, but it's a win. A win's a win. And that's the important thing right here. Even though the next time they play the Islanders, I may be uh, just peeking in on the third period just to see if, you know, the shot total is above, you know, 20. Hopefully it's going to be a little different. I think we played them in November again. So mark your calendars, everybody. It's uh, 
it's going to be a rough one on that one probably again. Get your pillows ready because you might need to sleep through the first two periods. <laughs> the other bright spots in this game, other than the dub, uh, you had Marco Casper registering just over 14 minutes time on ice, which is super awesome. Uh, he did have, it looks like, one block shot. He had two hits, uh, no takeaways or anything. 50% on the faceoff. Not sure exactly how many faceoffs he took during that game. But then the other bright spots is Simon Edvinson getting over 24 and a half uh, minutes time on ice. He actually outpaced Moritz Sider, who played 22 and a half minutes. And then someone even like Ben Sherratt, who had 23 and a half minutes. And obviously Alex Lyon getting the shutout so good looks on him yeah this was all round Derek it was just a boring game we already knew that uh I was kind of surprised that the Red Wings were so outshot the way that they were it was technically I said 29 to 11 but on um the NHL app it says 30 to 11 so freebie to both teams right just give them one extra one because it makes it sound a little bit better I guess but yeah, honestly, Derek, this was a little alarming because I was nervous that the Red Wings were going to go and continue this trend. And they essentially did against the New Jersey Devils, which somehow they still ended up winning, Derek, five to three. Like it shows down below with Talbot and that Comfer was actually out town. He had bubble guts. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that one tweet, but that was the most hilarious thing anyone could have posted. And it was just like, why do you have to do that, man? Like, why do you got to put him there? Like, okay, he's out. That's all we need to know. You don't got to let us know what's wrong, especially in that aspect. Tell, just say he has an upset stomach. That's all we need to know. We don't need to know the details of why he's out. We get it. It's okay. <laughs> But because of that, Marco Casper was implemented onto the second line, which is super awesome. He actually finished the game playing 18 minutes, 42 seconds time on ice. But this was a way better game, Derek. I wasn't expecting it to be as well as it ended up becoming only because of how offensively gifted the Devils are. And their defense is pretty good, too. And then their goaltending is pretty good, too. Uh, you got the Devils open up the scoring, but the Wings click quickly took the lead late in the first by Fisher and Alex DeBrincat. So it was great to see Fisher get one in, and then Alex DeBrincat, he's starting to find the net a little bit more. Uh, but obviously, he's still missing some wide open net shots. It's We'll talk about that in the next game. Um, uh, Cam Talbot making great saves uh, to save this Wings team. Honestly, Derek, that's something we're going to talk about too is how much goaltending has attributed it to the Red Wings night in, night out, regardless if it's a win or an owl. Uh, Wings take the lead midway through the third, thanks to Fisher fighting and getting the Wings on the power play. And Sherratt fights not too long after. And that leads the Devils to tying it 3-3 three to three on the power play. Kane gets the game winner, and Rasmussen gets the empty netter and posterizes Jack Hughes right here which is super awesome. Uh, Jack Hughes then gets a tamper tantrum afterwards about it, you know, but Derek, why don't you go ahead and tell me what you thought overall about this game? Oh, I mean, this is the kind of game I was kind of hoping the guys, obviously the shots not really there, but 40 to 20. Tell, yeah. 40 to 20. Not great. Oh God, not good at all. But, we're pretty much just piggybacking off of last season. Everyone said our shooting percentage couldn't keep up the way it was, but holy crap, it's kind of staying where it was last season. Not a lot of shots, a lot of weird passes. Like, I put it out there first. Boys just need to start shooting the puck. A garbage goal is still a goal. It doesn't matter how it goes in, as long as it goes in. But as we see right here, it worked for them. They got the quality over the quantity in this game. So I'm not really too upset, especially, I mean, look at that photo behind Zach right now. That that pretty much ties up how the game was going. They were all beating the crap out of each other. They were going back and forth. It was a pretty rough and rowdy game to the fact that we had, what, no seats left in the penalty box at one point. Yeah. So that was pretty funny to watch the four guys just chilling in there. I'm like, okay. Okay, we're putting some effort. We're getting some grit out there. I like that. Everyone's getting pissed off a little, throwing some fists. I'm like, this is cool. This is how the Red Wings, if they're not going to get the shots, I like to see the competitiveness in them like this. 
which obviously I want to see the shots. I'm not going to piggyback off that. If they get more shots, I'm going to anticipate that we get a lot more goals too. But 5-3, it's a good way to end the game. Boys did well this game. I thought their compete was really high. And playing one of the top teams apparently in the NHL right now, like you said, their offense, really high up there. Defense, they got Dougie Hamilton back this year for a full season coming up, it looks like. So, holy crap, their D is set up. And their goaltending, Marshall and Allen, holy crap. A 1A1B tandem like that, that should pretty much put you in a great spot. And holy crap, we made Marshall look like, man, his deal was not really worth it in this game. But that's just one game. No crapping on Markstrom too much, but I like the way the Red Wings did it. It looked really well out there. They competed. They did what they needed to do. And if they would continue to do this, I feel like the Red Wings would be doing great for the rest of the season. But if we go into the next game, I'm definitely going to have some different thoughts on how our compete was actually after that. But all in all, the Red Wings did great this game. Yeah, they did great. I mean, like I just said, outshot 40 to 20. So basically what they did against the New York New York Islanders, my worries then obviously carried over into this game. And my worries continued to carry over into the game against Buffalo, which we'll go into next. But yeah, the Red Wings, I guess if you want to call it what it is, they're being selective of their shots, but I'm not a firm believer in that. There have been many times where the Red Wings lack getting not getting into the ozone but just staying in there however i do agree with you that they did a better job against this new jersey double teams minus the first period i would say the second and the third is probably where they strived a little bit better minus towards the end of the game where new jersey was trying to obviously get back and tied the game up when it was four to three before michael rasmussen did his thing against jack hughes but uh some other bright spots in this game talbot had a 927 save percentage which is super awesome Love seeing him and Alex Lyon continuing to just stand on their heads. That's exactly what they're doing. Because I do believe, Derek, if, and this is no offense to Huso, but if you played Huso in any of these three games, I would say that all three of these games would have been Al's, uh, personally to me. But the bright spots, Kane, Raymond, and Alex Brink had had two point nights, uh, as well as the Talbot thing. And then Michael Rasmussen getting the empty netter. And sorry, Jack. Not sorry, but Derek, let's go ahead and move on to the wings versus Buffalo game. I'll let you go ahead and take this one over. I feel like I've been talking nonstop. No, alrighty, but I got you. So wings versus Buffalo, not the outcome we wanted, but we'll jump into it. Anyways, line in net tonight. And again, goaltending staying on their heads. Don't know what to do about this. Obviously the score may predict something different, but I'll get into the details real quick here. Line in that Buffalo opens up the scoring on the power play. Zucker gets his first goal on the new team. Could for him. Unfortunately, it did go off a tip off Petrie's stick. So line really couldn't do much about that. He was expecting one shot. Petrie sent a completely different direction up into the top corner of the net. Nothing line can do about that from about five feet away. And let's just remember that right before that, the save that line did make was from Tage Thompson, which was recordably the hardest shot now in the yeah. nhl at 104.64 miles per hour yeah <laughs> like holy crap i just literally saw him lock up literally all the way back and yeah on that crap he got all that puck i was like when he on. took that shot initially during the game, I didn't think it was that hard of a shot until everyone started talking about it and I saw the replays and I was like how did Alex like I could see why Alex Lyon wasn't able to control that puck. <laughs> like that was There's absolutely no gross. It was now. fire. Straight fire. I'm just happy that he went down at the right time because that puck was touched his stick and disappeared. And the next time I saw it, it was like five feet out of the pet bouncing out. I was like, whoa, okay. Yeah. So not really upset. Can't be upset with Lyon on that one. Bad tip from Petrie. It is what it is. But then let's see. Wayne's moving. Wings were moving pretty slow in that first period. Um, it wasn't the great start that we wanted to see. They were pretty lackluster. I thought the energy from the last previous game from New Jersey wasn't really there. But thankfully, Cat finds it back back of the net and helps set with help from Cider and Raymond for a, make it one two, and that's how the end of the first period. Then second period starts up. We got Tage with another goal. 
of course. I mean, my fantasy team's pretty happy, but my heart's not happy because I kind of want them to lose in this game, but it is what it is. So one to three there. Then we've got Raz with a nice little backhand with help from Cider and Edvinson there. Got a little, looks like a little injury from him, falling on the back of a someone's skate, but hey, he put the puck home. That's all that matters. Rasmussen, two goals, two games, back-to-back. -back. I'm okay with that. Hey, he must have bruised his tailbone or something, but that's the type of stuff that you want to see from like a Rasmussen because talking about it, looking back at his draft year, that's exactly one of the reasons why they drafted him because he was that in front of the net guy, right, especially on the power play who could just sit in front of the net, the Thomas Holmstrom type, right? But we haven't really seen too much of that in his tenure as a Detroit Red Wing in the NHL. So hopefully there's more of those in the future, but I think he definitely bruised his tailbone or something because he was very, not very slow to get up, but he definitely looked like he was in some pain, but that was a great goal all around by Michael Rasmussen. So sick. Yeah. I was really happy that he found that puck right away after that shot, after whatever defenseman was sitting there, nailed him, found it right away and smacked it. And that was good looks on him. So that basically makes it two to two. Or two to three, sorry, two to two. And then right after that, Lucas Ramey coming up strong with a shorty, his first of his career to make it 3-3. Three, three. Oh, see, that's what I'm talking about. We all watched that boy walk down. They took away the passing lane, but that boy saw it. He took the shot. Like, I want them to take the shots. It doesn't have to be the most beautiful shot in the world. It went, I think, low, what, blocker side maybe on uh, Luke. Oh, God. What's Buffalo's goalie's name? Oh, I think it's pronounced uh, Luko Pekkanen or something like that. I have no <laughs> idea either how to pronounce it properly. <laughs> so I'm right there with you, Derek. I was like, I'm not even going to try that right now. I've heard like 20 times during the game because he did make some decent saves on the Red Wings because the Red Wings had a lot of opportunities out there. But that made it 3-3 on a shorty. That was beautiful. Our, yeah. our PK actually finally did something very good. Stopping them from getting any kind of goals in, obviously. We all know what the record is right now. It is what it is. But that's something to actually look at, to be happy about. Our special teams did something. Well, especially like we mentioned on the last episode, the Red Wings, I mean, both their power play and the PK special teams are not being very special so far this season. So hopefully that kind of bumped them up a little bit in the rankings. But the Red Wings still have a lot of work to do. Yeah, no, you know that that something's going to happen when you get Mickey Redmond on the call saying, here we go. Oh, boy. You know, situations like that. So we it, we all instantly knew that it was going to go in. So, yeah, good looks on Lucas Raymond for getting his first career uh, shorthanded goal. And first goal of the year. Good looks on it. I literally put that in the chat. I'm like, please, can Lucas I, – I love his seven assists. And I was like, fucking the boy, please score. Then he went out there and scored. I was like – I start talking to, about this stuff a lot more in the group chats because apparently when we talk it into existence, it happens. And I loved it. But then we had Byram scores. Uh... Oh, wow, that's like looking at the cut this part out. <laughs> I was like, shit, where'd I go? I went from one line to the other. But then we got Byram who scores at the very end of the period, making it three to four. And unfortunately, we see Jeff Petrie kind of get manhandled down at the bottom. And again, not a lion's fault. Goes right off of Petrie's back leg because he got pushed back into the net and it goes right in. So Petrie technically has, what, two goals this game just on the wrong team? <laughs> he's got three goals. Three goals against us so far this season. It seems like, yeah, he's playing more for the opposition than he is for the Detroit Red Wings. Yeah, in that situation, I was just like, Petrie, like, do you not know how to box out a player? It can't be that difficult. You've been in the league for how long? That one I was definitely griping about. That wasn't my favorite thing to see. I get it that it bounced off of him, but he's getting pushed into his own net. Like, you're, you got to play better defense than that. And then you got to talking to from Boomer after that, too, uh, kind of showing him exactly what happened. And Jeff Petrie's like, yeah, dude, I was there. Like, I know exactly what happened. I got ragged all out there essentially and scored on our own team. But yeah, there's, there's, it's very unfortunate in how it all worked out. But yeah, even the empty net goal, Derek, you know, that came with like under a minute left in the game. The Red Wings didn't pull their goalie, I think with like under two minutes or maybe just above two minutes. And you look at some of the other teams that we play against, I guess you can use New Jersey and even the Islanders as an example. They're pouring their goalies with like four 
three minutes left in the game. That's the type of stuff I want to see. And there were a couple opportunities where Coach Lalone could have pulled Alex Lyon because they were in the offensive zone. But it goes back to it where the Red Wings so far this season have struggled at times keeping the puck in the offensive zone. That's a huge issue. And it's something not not really to worry about. That's not for us to worry, but it is an issue that we as fans are noticing and seeing that there's no offensive production coming from this team. Um, thoughts on that real quick, if you agree with me or disagree or just overall. I mean, I agree completely at this point. I mean, we saw what they did after they pulled the goalie, and it, man, even with that Kane little, what was that? He just kind of like, hesitated a little too much there at the end and never got that one first shot off obviously the second shot ran up the post but we saw what happened after they hit the post it went right out to the offense and of uh new new jersey yeah, buffalo and uh we, they got an empty netter out of it like i feel like we're stuttering a little too much we're taking our time a little too much we we're trying to find that perfect placement the boys need to stop doing that they just need to do what they know they do and put a puck on net that's the only thing that we're missing right now. Like if we start throwing that puck a lot more in the right directions, instead of trying to make these little dinky passes back and forth right in front of the goalie, I feel like it's going to be a whole different ball game for the boys. Like that's it's a lot even, more scoring. Yeah. And it's not even just in front of the net, the dinky passing like you're talking about. I do agree with you, but there were other uh, instances too. I think, there was a pass with Christian Fisher. He just does it like in middle open ice, which which created an opportunity for the Buffalo Sabres. I'm not talking about the one where there was the whole line change and everything. But yeah, Christian Fisher, I would say he definitely didn't have the greatest game. I mean, the Red Wings had 27 giveaways in this game. That's that's a lot compared to Buffalo's 18. So Buffalo took advantage of every opportunity that they could. And even going back to the whole first period, I mean, the Red Wings were out shot. 9 to 16, uh, you know, even in the second, they put up a little bit more more offense in and it showed right in that second period alone, but 12 to 17. And then even in the third, they only have four shots on that to Buffalo six and outshot totally 39 to 25. Um, the bright spots, I would say, is that Casper was a plus one. He played 14, 45. That's that's pretty much it. He had two he had two takeaways. Actually, there was right before we started recording. I said this. I was like, I didn't want to say everything before we started recording because I won't remember during the recording. But Marco Casper looked pretty good out there. I know that he's not shooting the puck like at all. I think he has total one shot on that since being called up. But he has been a huge difference maker on this team. He was centering the fourth line. So he's essentially at this point, Derek, he's taken Joe Valeno's job because they shifted Valeno over to the wing to see if that would get Valeno going. It wasn't working for him being the center there. And they were with Giannis and Berggren. And I called both Valeno and Berggren and Rasmussen out. I do owe Rasmussen an apology, but Valeno and Berggren got to get it going. Valeno's definitely had more games than Berggren, but Berggren, this isn't his first go around in the NHL either. Right. So I do believe that there's a little bit more that those two could be doing to help out this team, but we'll kind of go in depth maybe about that a little bit more. But the other bright spots is that Evanson continues to showcase that he can play well over 20 minutes a night. He played 22 50 and then Moritz Sider 24 35 as well. And Alex Lyon, regardless of them losing the game, I'm actually surprised that his save percentage was an 895. He made 34 out of 38 saves, but it's just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes, Derek. It is what it is. It was a tough out to take, but the Red Wings definitely did not give us a reason to say otherwise. I don't think that they deserved to win that game. Tough out, no, but they did. didn't deserve it. They definitely got outplayed, and I'll give it to Lyon. I still say it should have been a three to two game minus those two shots that uh, Petrie put in his own net, basically. Shoot, so, dude, I, I thought it I thought it should have been seven to three. Honestly, I thought Buffalo I thought Alex Lyon was the reason why it was closer than it than it actually was, to be honest with you. And that's kind of the stick point here, right? This whole entire season is that this goaltending is pretty much one of the main reasons why this team is staying within these games granted they won 
the three games before, obviously, the Buffalo Sabres game. They play today against Connor McDavid and the Oilers. That's going to be freakishly horrifying, right? I mean, based on the way that the Red Wings have playing, maybe they can get over 30 shots. They got Calvin Picard and not for the Edmonton Oilers. Maybe the Wings can take advantage of that. But so far, when we've seen the Red Wings play against high-octane offensive teams, they can't get it going. I mean, have you seen our defense? We have two. We basically have two at this point. And they're called Simon and Ed. And they're on one line basically all the time. Simon and Ed. (laughs) Simon and Ed. That's the same person. The S name's got me. I'm not getting this out. We're keeping this in here. Uh, Simon and Mo. Simon and Cider. Ed. There we go. That makes me feel better. S name's got me for a second, but we basically just have two defensemen, and they're both under the age of twenty or twenty-three or younger. Everybody else is basically a black hole at this point. Like, I don't know what else we can do about this because there is no production. There's no defense from those guys underneath. It's like once they get to the zone, it's pretty much just back and forth and they take control. And the fact that they can't get the puck out of the zone unless it's those two guys basically working on it, that's going to be really hard for our offense to generate anything. And our offense is having trouble generating anything to begin with. So what's that going to do against a high-octane team like Edmonton? I mean, it worked a little bit against New Jersey. I'll give them that. We worked out well for, against a team that is supposedly supposed to be one of the top teams in the NHL right now. But against Edmonton, where we have the two best players practically in the entire world going against, going against us in one line, I don't know how that's going to work out unless we're basically going to pull the old Red Wing card out and play to our co- opponent's level randomly again, where we just keep dropping and down, going up when the team's good. Like Otherwise, it's... <laughs> I hope I'm wrong, but this game might be a little rough to watch tonight for us. This might be one of the few parts or points where I actually disagree with you. I not fully disagree with you with what you just said, and I feel like I agree with you guys a lot. But I think the I believe that the Red Wings are actually doing a lot better this year compared to last year of getting the puck out of their zone. I would say the main issue is that the... Yeah, the other teams, they're just kind of breaking us down in our zone, but we're doing not so much breaking us down. How do I want to say this? They're staying in our zone. They're doing a really good job of staying in our zone. We're doing a really good job at getting the pucks out of it, I would say, or at least taking away the puck. We're blocking the shots. I think the biggest issue that we have is that not because we're spending too much time in our own zone. To me... We don't know how to stay in the offensive zone. You watch it, Derek. You watch, you know, our three forwards go up together. You know, you got, you know, someone's coming up the center with a puck. Let's say that's Dylan Larkin. He passes it off to Raymond, who's standing there on the blue line, tries to go down the boards. They dump it. That's pretty much it. Or they all go in together and somehow they're just not able to be where the puck is going to end up being at. Like the other teams just are doing a really good job at shutting down our offense, which is super surprising compared to last year where, you know, at the start of the season and many points throughout the season, Derek, the Red Wings looked like one of the better offensively gifted teams in the NHL. Granted, we don't have a David Perron. We don't have a Daniel Sprong. We don't have a Jake Wallman anymore, but you added a Tarasenko. You recouped Kane. But we're going to go ahead and jump into that pretty soon with our main topics. But first, we're going to change it up a bit, Derek. We're actually going to go into the Red Wings news and around the league news because of how little we have on there. With Patrick Kane scoring his 77th career game-winning goal against the New Jersey Devils on Thursday night, that ties Brad Marchand for fifth among all active skaters, which is super awesome. And I heard... I think it was this morning or yesterday that Brad Marchand and the Bruins are working on a three-year extended extension on a contract with them, which I absolutely hate. Brad Marchand just needs to retire because I'm sick of him licking other people's faces. <laughs> that was literally my only thought process. It's like anytime I think of Brad Marchand, it's just him licking somebody nowadays. I don't even care how good he is at hockey. It's like he's just going to lick someone again at some point. Let's be honest. His last game of his career, he's going to go out there and go, 
on someone's face and get kicked <laughs> out or some shit like that. I'm like, yep, that's brand March in fashion right there. Also on Thursday, Axel Sandin Palika had a three-point night scoring a filthy coast-to-coast game-winning goal, and MBN scored his first goal of the season. Did you see that goal by a- ASP, Derek? Oh, dude, end-to-end? That was beautiful. Just went through the entire team. I mean, what was it, overtime two? Just ended the no, entire it was, game. No, no, it was in the third period. There was under, like two minutes ago it was just about mm-hmm. to go under one minute but yeah it was yeah continue sorry i was like close enough but god damn yeah. that was filthy that boy oh like you said in the group chat he ain't going to grand rapids after next year he's probably coming straight to the red Wings, man that boy is filthy out there oh the i'd red- love to see it and the red wings sure could use him right about now the red wings are looking very bleak on right-handed defensemen and it's Sucks to say that because they have an Albert Johansson. Granted, he's not really a right-handed defenseman, but they have an Albert Johansson just sitting in the press box waiting to play. And he was by far in the two games that he played, he was a really good defenseman for him. So hopefully they I'd figure it a out. Lot like, better than Petrie. Yeah. Yeah. That you know, Hall's been Hall's been all right. I would say I'd rather have Hall over Petrie at this point. Would you agree? Oh, I would definitely agree on that. Obviously, the only thing that hurts us a little bit is that cap pit that he has. But at the same time, he's been playing a lot better. He's been playing to his skill level, which is what I like to see. But yeah, uh, over every single game he's played in, a lot better than what Peachy's been showing. And I can see someone else sitting in that press box over Aljo. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure. Well, we got more prospect stuff here for Red Wings news. It must have been a great week for prospects because I said about every five games I'll do a prospect corner, but here we are. We're going to start doing it every week, it seems like, at this point. Koso looking sexy as always, starting a 4-1 and one record with a goal against average of 1.54 and a save percentage of 954 and one and a half shutouts. Oh, it's because he had to fill in for Huso. I do have it down here that the Griffins currently are 4-1, to one. The same stat as Kosa and who so injured her himself uh supposedly it's not the same injury as he got previously it's a different one but that's all the news that we have on that so Derek I'll let you speak on Kosa a little bit what do you you're actually the one who put this note in here but why don't you go ahead and talk about your boy that you love so much and want to see in a Red Wings uh jersey upcoming oh my god I'm gonna get his (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm so excited about this kid, man. I know it's only five games into the season, and they do have one loss, but my goodness, he is just blowing up that league right now. He is outstanding. His athleticism has been great down there. All his highlights. If you haven't seen his highlights, go watch some Griffin's highlights about all his saves. He is looking outstanding. Even in the games where they're getting outshot, kind of similar to the Red Wings. I'm pretty sure, to, what, two games ago, it was like, Doubled the shots that the Griffins got, but they still won. Yep. Oh, yeah. That was the game that Kosa had to fill in for Huso. Yeah, they got outshot. Yep. My goodness. It, he just looks fantastic. Like, this is like his, a beagle look at his elite prospect stats from when he started to where he is now, just progressively getting better and better. And he did great last season. His stats looked great last year, but compared to right now, if you can keep this up, even after the last game, oh, no, phone, do not die on me with my notes. I was like, yeah, 10%, we're good, we can make it. But the dude is doing fantastic. Like, this is what we want to see from our next, pretty much, do I say, our next goalie for the next, what, eight, You 10, hope your franchise. Years? Yeah, you Thank hope you, your French. franchise will tire. <laughs> Yeah, I could not remember the word I was looking for. I'm like, I'm just going to go year wise at this point. Next franchise goaltender. And he's looking exactly like that right now. Like, this is what we want to see. Do you in my prediction? If everyone saw our last our prediction episode of our hot takes, that's what it was. I'm saying Kosek is going to get some games this year. Obviously, right now, watching our goaltenders play the way they are. I can see why that might not happen because, yeah. holy crap, our goalies are doing pretty well. Yeah, like <laughs> uh, for the for what they have in front of them, they're doing pretty fantastic. And I'm pre- is what is Lion still top of the league in save percentage right now, or did he fall a little bit? Because after last before first la- yesterday, he was number one in the league for save percentages, which is pretty fantastic. He is now fourth, um, but he's 
the top two right now, they're under five games played. So I guess you could consider him second. He's got a 940 save percentage overall right now in the five games played so far this season with a 205 goals against average. So he's killing it still. I can't go wrong about that. So obviously my hot take may not come to fruition with how the goalies are playing right now. Obviously the season's still early. Something could happen. Obviously we already saw Huso go down. So are they going to bring Huso back up if say Kim or Line gets injured, gets sick, or are they going to try to shift it to the new up and comer and see what he can do? Probably more so going to be Huso, but you never know what's going to happen. If he keeps this stride up in the AHL, I really can't see a reason why he would leave him down there, though, to at least not get some time up here, especially if we're anticipating him coming to the net. I almost said the AHL again, coming to the NHL next year. So I want to see him get some reps at least. That way he just doesn't get blown away in the first five games by the incredible competition that is the NHL compared to the AHL, which is a completely different ballgame. But as of right now, everything... Goalie wise, Red Wings Griffin's doing pretty well. Yeah, I would say that's definitely the bright spot for both teams currently right now. And if you said that to me five years ago, I would have laughed right in your face because <laughs> we had absolutely nothing at all. So moving along, Danielson with his first pro career goal Friday night, one goal and one assist in six games. I'm not really too concerned about the point production. This is his first season in the AHL. I mean, similar situation to where Marco Casper and some other of the young guys had rough starts to the beginning of the season, right? He's just getting acclimated. So we might see that go up as time progresses, but so far so good. I haven't really been able to catch any of the games. I would suggest going over to Hockey Town West podcast. Uh, Nick and Brandon and Travis, they do a fantastic job covering those guys in the Toledo Wildlife. So go ahead and check them out if you have an opportunity. They're on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple, I believe, as well. So, Derek, do you have any concerns with Dane Danielson or anything with this points? Oh, yeah. He has to get some time to get his feet moving in that league. It's a completely different world than the WHL, especially with the point production-wise, because obviously WHL, you see people scoring, getting points. Obviously, we saw Connor Bedard get, what, 260 points in his last year. It's not the biggest craze in the world. Everyone's going to get a lot of points there. I'm just happy to see that he's actually doing some stuff on the team. He's looking pretty good from his highlights that I've seen. He's pretty productive. He's doing a lot of physicality, and he can move the puck still. So he's not causing any damage. So I consider that a win-win right now. Moving on to around the league news. Derek, you put this in here. Uh, Scott Arneal becomes first NHL you said couch coach ever to collect a win in his first eight games. Jets are 8-0-0. So they're pretty sure they're the last undefeated team, which is – not it's it's surprising, but it's not at the same time compared to last season. They signed all those huge contracts, uh, Kyle Connor and then uh, Connor Hollabuck. But glad to see that they're actually turning it around. Uh, I like a lot of their players that they have on their team. Uh, I certainly wish the Red Wings were in their position right now, for sure. Uh, another news, Marsh and go ahead. What? Oh, I, like, I just can't argue that if the Red Wings were eight and no, let me tell you, I'd probably be here in like 5,000 jerseys right now because I didn't know who I'd be more happy with. Right. <laughs> and other news, Martian defense. Uh, Derek also put couch here, but coach after being chewed oh, out, says players are too soft nowadays. Loki agree in which someone would make Lalone freak out like that. Um, go, go ahead and go in depth to talking about that a little bit, Derek. I mean, we saw it. Everyone who saw that March and getting chewed out by his coach and he actually everyone kind of freaked out afterwards on the coach for doing that to him. And he's like, that's what a coach does. Like he hold is supposed to yell at you. Yeah. yeah. Hold your boys accountable. Yell at them. If they're not doing it. you're getting paid millions upon millions of dollars to be in this league. And if you're messing up, you should have somebody right down your neck, making sure that you're not going to mess up like that again. And that's and your captain too. That's your captain. Jesus. Yeah. And he's getting rimmed out by your coach. And I love how I'll never say this probably ever again, but I love how Marchand took it and I love his response to it. 
we are getting a little too soft in this league. People need to be a little more aggressive. I know how obviously we've had a few coaches in the last year or two that uh, are a little tad bit aggressive in their coaching styles, which I will say they are slightly wrong in what their methods are. But, you, yeah, you got to get reamed out once in a while. And yeah. if I could see just a smidgen of that in Derek alone, I'd be a little happier too, because that man, every time they pan over to him, just <laughs> just sitting there, just looking, just not doing too much. Yeah. It's like, I want some emotion. Don't giggle and laugh just because something stupid happened. Like, even when something bad happens, he's over there like, it's like, no, be pissed. Start screaming. Get mad at the refs. Get kicked out of a game. We haven't seen that one in two years. Like, give us some sort of emotion. And that's what I want to see from enforces that on your players, and your players end up using that emotion to do better. And that's how Marchand took it, and he's saying that to the league now. Would you say that that's a fault on, and not just to pick on Derek Lalone, but is that just a thing that the league is moving towards, that these coaches have to be not as... I'll just use this word. This may not be the correct word for it, aggressive towards their players, or is it more so just the upper management understands that players nowadays, now this younger generation, they don't interact with that type of behavior to get them going. I guess if you want to call it tough love, right? Which side is it? Is it more so just the next generation of coaches or is it, the coaches are adapting to the players in your mind, Eric. I feel like it has to be a mixture of both. Like there's a sweet spot in there for whatever is about to happen. And I feel like obviously the Red Wings aren't hitting that sweet spot, but other teams are getting a little more aggressive than that. And it seems to be working still. Like obviously we don't want our coaches freaking out on our players, especially our young guys who don't have as like March him been in the league a long time he should know what to do obviously right. that's a whole different circumstance with him he's old you can chew him out and he's gonna sit there and be like yep that's probably what i needed thank you coach yeah other players he say you have an 18 19 20 year old coming up you might make them cry doing that right now i really don't know <laughs> i feel like people are get like obviously we're old we're 28 30 right now like i'm used to, like when i was playing if you didn't get chewed at by your coach for doing something stupid, your coach didn't really care about you that much. They didn't really have too much thought in what you're going to be able to, like your production wasn't going to be there for them. So that's why they didn't care. And so that's what I think they need to bring back a little bit to push these guys to make sure like, okay, we're here. We see what you're doing and we're going to get on your ass. Cause we know what you can do and we know what you should be doing. So I feel like there's going to be that sweet spot where they got to find right now where they're not freaking out these young guys, but they're also pushing them to their best cap, best capability that they have. No, overall, I, I really do agree with you. And I mean, it's the same thing with any normal job, right? You get hired for the performance that you can give, right? And if you're not performing, then you're going to get that verbal warning, right? And that's exactly what Austin's head coach did with Marshan. That's what we would like to see Derek Lalone do with his players. Obviously, we don't know what happens behind the closed doors. I'm sure there's a lot more that goes into it than we realize. And maybe they just put on the persona of the happy faces like everything's fine. Who knows? But yeah, I would agree that sometimes there is a time and place where you have to rip and tear into your players, not exactly just the young players, because a lot of them are still learning, like Marco Casper, Simon Evanson. You can even throw Jan and Tim Berggren in there if you really wanted to. But sometimes it's just you got to put on that tough love to get the players to do exactly what they need to do. And it's almost like an, an awakening to them sometimes, right? Like open up your eyes, get to work, feet on the ground and work hard. So time will tell. We'll see if that works out for the Red Wings or not moving along. But Derek, let's go ahead and jump into the main topic of what's working. And what's not for the Red Wings? And this primarily is five on five. Uh, so I'm just going to break it down like this. We're going to talk about what's working. And then we'll save the best for last. The What's not working, Derek, right? So we'll probably touch more on that. But what's working right now, Derek? Five on five. The Red Wings are fourth in takeaways from opponents. 47. They're 30th in giveaways to the opponents. They're 96. 
32nd and D zone giveaways, 35, 14th and block shots, 119. And then this is in all situations, but seventh and averaging 17 and a half block shots per game. Uh, Casper Edmondson and goaltending, uh, they're working for us, which is astounding to me to say, because I thought it would kind of be the opposite. I do have on here that the top line is working. They're definitely the best working line that the Red Wings have outside of the cider and Edmondson pairing, which that hot take, I mean, it's already it's already met us right where we said we're going to see the majority of the season. I don't see how you can change it from, from here on out, but, and the not working, we'll talk about that. It's very depressing, but uh, yeah. And the other last thing I have is that Michael Rasmussen's out there trucking players. He's doing exactly what he's doing. And once again, I'm all apologizing, uh, apologize to him for calling him out last episode. He's just a hard, hard worker granted he only got to play 11 minutes the last game and probably due to him getting essentially a broken tailbone it seemed like but um Derek your thoughts with 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 what's working and what you're seeing you can even talk about the PK and the special teams if you think the some some bright spots are working I think the top power play unit looks good but um there's definitely some things that needs to be worked on but overall what do you what do you think about the what's working for them on five on five and what I think is working, I mean, basically everything you said is pretty on key for how we're doing right now. Obviously, I want to see a little bit more production from that first line out there. I feel like we have a lot more to get from those guys. And obviously, if you watch any of the games, you probably have seen to bring up miss a few open nets that are like the entirety of the net, which was open, which is kind of depressing to some of the times when he misses that. But, man, Casper has been a ray of sunshine for us. Like, I love the fact that he got brought up finally. He should have been brought up at the beginning of the season. But what is he? Where would he be, like, four and one with him being up now? He's doing pretty fantastic on three and three one. one. Yeah. One of those two. How yeah. many games he's been with us? Only one loss in there so far. That I'm pretty sure he's been with us. So that's pretty good from the games that he's played. But Edmondson doing pretty well out there. Obviously, we these young guys, we're going to see some errors in their game right now, and that's nothing to be upset about because that's how the game's going to go for them. They're young, they're new to the league, and they're going to have to make these mistakes to learn from them. So that's okay. Obviously, that one little pass from Edmondson the other night where it just went over to the guy that was getting off and someone had to sit on the bench for a second before they could get on, that was that hurt. That hurt to watch, but again, it's a learning curve. Should that person have left Edmondson by himself down there? Probably not. Should Edmondson probably looked up to see that the guy wasn't even facing him anymore? Probably. It is what it is. Stuff happens like that. In all, they've been doing great. Goaltending been fantastic. Cam and Lion. I really can't ask much more of those guys. Like they're playing probably out of their minds right now and keeping us in pretty much all of these games. Otherwise, what are we probably like? one in seven at this point at best. I'm pretty sure we had one game where the deserve a win meter was pretty much 50%. Every other game has been ungodly against us. Yeah. And I'm going to say most of those games had to do with our goaltending, keeping our asses in it. So I'm pretty happy what they were doing. And obviously Raz, I want to see a little bit more compete out of him, but at the same time, when he's standing like right behind you, Zach, that makes me happy. The fight he got into, the big hits, he's doing exactly what he did last night when he just sits in front of the net, being a big old massive pylon in front of the goalie, not getting pushed around. And this is a pylon in a good way, not the bad way. <laughs> Let I me say that right now. <laughs> a he's a good pylon right there. That's what I want from him. I want his big ass butt right in front of that net so the goalie can't see around him. He's six six. Most goalies are 6'6", six, six, the 6'4", six, in that range. He's blocking them. That's what we want to see, and he was able to score on that. It looked great. That's what I want to keep see, keep going. Obviously, there are some things that I want to see us improve on, which we'll get into here in a second, but I'm not upset with the takeaways in our D zone. That's pretty good. That's probably one of the reasons why they're not getting as quality of opportunities. Obviously, we're seeing a lot of shots against. But the shots against aren't great shots. There's nothing really to be worried about. Our goalies should be able to save those no matter what. If someone just shoots it into their belly, that's good. That's what we want to see. That means our defense pushing out on them. 
Our offense is there. It's pretty much just crushing those guys down to the point where they have to take a shot. Like I've said, garbage goals are garbage goals for any kind of team out there. So everyone should be taking shots, including the Red Wings. But I won't jump too hard into that right now. But in all, there's quite a – we do have some good things. And on paper, this team is – it looks good. The team looks good on paper. I just need them to all show that on the ice now. But, Zach, let's get into the part that we don't want to talk about, the things that are probably hurting us the most right now. Yeah, yeah. The things that are not working, and this is this is really sad to say, is that 5v5 five, five five expected goal for their, the Red Wings are dead last with 1.77. They're 32nd in shots on net, 8th in shots against, 32nd in danger shots, um, 10. So that's them like going into the offensive zone and creating high danger shooting shots. Um, that's, that's really low. I believe the highest team was almost in the forties or maybe they were, um, the Petrie and Shira pair. It's been absolutely horrible. Gustafson has not looked good at all. And, um, minus the top line, the other three forward lines, they need a shakeup. I mean, yeah, you added Marco Casper in there and that's definitely been a breath of fresh air. And, you know, the benefit of the doubt for that is, is that because of the consistent changing that they're doing, I mean, we've seen multiple players move up and down or get injured and called up. So there's, you know, chemistry has to be made there. But um, special teams, power play, PK, we talked about that last week on a little bit. They're, they're not doing well whatsoever. And then shooting and shots against yeah this team i mean Derek, it kind of goes back i mean like i said earlier during this recording i mean i don't think it's more so that they can't get the puck out of the defensive zone because like i just showed like they're like i said they're 32nd in d zone giveaways they they're 14th in block shots um in all situations they're seventh and 17 and a half block shots per game i think that's covered I think at the end of the day, what's happening is that, and I talked about this, I think last episode or whenever I talked about it, they're all a blur now, but it makes me wonder if the Red Wings tried to prioritize so much defense that not saying that they forgot how to play offense, but maybe that just wasn't something that they tried to work on so hard in the off season because of how last season went, the defense was completely atrocious, but I mean, outside of the Cider and Edmondson pairing, the defense is just not good whatsoever. We can definitely say majority of the goals, not really to pick on people, but we're primarily because defense weren't looking the greatest at all. Um, there's, you know, take it over for me, Derek. I'm so sad now. Yeah, it's kind of depressing to go over this. Like, you're on a run. The defense is not looking good. We see a lot of errors out there. We see a lot of mistakes. We see Sherratt flipping over backwards, trying to get a pass going to the back door, which he should have just been covering that man initially and not trying to stop a pass that was going behind him. Or we have Petrie getting pushed around into the net, scoring goals on himself. Like, there's a lot of issues besides, obviously, what you said, Evanson and Moe, they're doing well. And, again, they're both young. Obviously, almost said it again. We have Cider up there with a brand new contract who's getting paid out the wazoo right now, obviously. A little underpaid, what most people would think for this guy. But we could see a little bit more action from him, I feel like, over the last few games. I feel like he's been making a couple more mistakes than he usually does. But I feel like he's trying to compensate a little bit from what was last year where he was just that defensive D trying to keep the entire team together because he was the only person we could rely on going back that way to the point now where we have Evanson with him where one of them can actually make a rush as we see Evanson do quite a bit because the boy has some skill we see his puck control out there and he does mm -hmm. pretty well with it his stride is his he's got a long stride I can't remember what game it was but he just ran up on the right side of the ice and just kind of blown past like the forward crew. And he was basically passing the whole entire defensive crew as well, based on his stride and his long reach. So yeah, I would agree. And I, I do like him jumping into place. I would like to see Moritz Sider do a little bit more of that, but also, yeah, it's just very unfortunate that our, 
it's fortunate, but it's unfortunate. Our top two, they are Simon Edmondson is the second best defenseman on this team. He really is. It's unfortunate, but fortunate they get to play together. But you look at the other two pairings. I mean, I did just receive the text or not the text, but the the tweet. Um, Anzar Khan did post that Ole Mata and Albert Johansson will be in tonight against the Edmonton Oilers. So there's a little switch up that we like to see. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. So continue on with your what's not working, Derek. No, oh, it's okay. But another thing, like as we just stated, that you've seen Edmondson up there striding past all our forwards. There's the other issue. We're slow as heck. <laughs> Why does our offense have no speed? We should obviously Edmondson is massive. So his stride is gonna push him probably twice as far as anyone on our team right now, just after one push. But we have no speed and we have no compete going that way in that direction. Maybe Raymond, who is the only one capable of getting it up to a top speed that can actually blow past people, Larkin yeah. at times, maybe. But other than that, we got what Debrinket, Kane, Tarasenko, all of our top guys that are not fast anymore. Good puck control. Well, let's not get that wrong. They have great control down there with the puck. You give them the puck in the offensive zone, they'll make something happen with it. But they're not going to be the first guys down there. But we don't really have anybody down there who's going to get there, which is goes to our dump and chase method that the Red Wings have been implementing for the last, what, five years? And we've been realizing it's a total failure because we can dump it. Yeah, sure. But there's no one chasing the puck. Like, we pretty much throw it down, then all of a sudden they're coming back the other way because everyone's changing. No one can get down there to beat the other guys. And it just looks rough in the end. And even from our young guys, the only person I really see doing that, like we just said, is Casper. And we have Beleno and Bergeron down there who are supposed to be these quick, offensive-minded guys. And they're nowhere to be seen. Like, I might see one flash from Bergeron maybe once a game at best at this point where he gets one shot or one good pass in. I had someone ask me the other day if Valeno was even still on the team. I was, <laughs> you took the words out of my mouth at that point, buddy, because I have not seen anything from Valeno. And that's the really sad part about after going through all that arbitration, going through all the deals and all that stuff to get where he's get what he's paying now. And he's just basically disappeared off the map. Like he did a lot. I feel like he did a lot better last year than what he's doing right now. And production wise, point wise, showing what he can do, his skill wise, even like we should be a lot better of a team than what we're showing right now on the ice. Paper wise, we look fantastic. Ice wise, there's an issue going in with a lot of things right now. And that comes down to our defense, our bottom six, obviously, our. Second line, obviously, is getting switched in and out quite a bit. So we really just don't know where we're setting, like, leading in with those guys right now. So it's kind of a hit or miss. Obviously, Casper, like you said, breath of fresh air to see up there. He's given that little bit more compete that we need, especially between the two old boys of Kane and Terrence Zinko. I like to see that. He's the one that breaks down the ice. He gets into the faces of everybody, and he makes a play down there while the other guys, you know, make their way down the ice because they can't keep up with them. Oh, Gasper is slick with the puck. There were a couple of times where I saw him rushing into the offensive zone by himself with the puck, especially when he's on the power play. I think it was the last game against the Sabres. They gave him some power play time, and I thought he looked really good. I think they should keep him on the power play. And talking about the not, what's not working, going more in depth in, in the special teams, I absolutely hate the power play setups that they have going. I don't want Gustafson as the power play quarterback on the PP1 anymore. That should be most siders, most siders only. And I think it's stupid. I'm just going to say it flat out. It's stupid that you're putting them up there because Alex and Brinkhead and Kane are on there. I just think that's absolutely stupid. You shouldn't be doing something like that. And, and they keep on changing in and out too, right? So there's a lot of line changes, a lot of special team changes. I don't like that Sherrod and Petrie are on a PK together. I think that's absolutely stupid. Um, just calling it like it is because I'm a fan just like you guys, the viewers, watchers, fans alike, right? So uh, this is me griping. I pretty much try to be the level-headed guy on here. I allow Derek to be the happy guy, and then Carlo can be the more <laughs> down-to-earth guy. I like to be the happy middle 
kind of guy, but I'm um, filling in for Carlo today. But uh, I, honestly, what Carlo was saying, even towards the end of last year, what he's been saying, even in this year, kind of with him, where the hot seat continues to grow for Derek Lalone and, and this coaching staff. I mean, I've been hypercritical about the assistant coaches all of last year. I wasn't ready to say it was all alone. I still don't think it's all alone, but players don't get fired. Coaches do. We've seen St. Louis where they were dead last in the league by New Year, and they ended up winning the Stanley Cup that year. Not saying the Red Wings have an opportunity like that, but you can make a coaching change down the line, potentially, or at least a trade somewhere. I, I firmly believe Bear Green and Valena would be the first two out, to be honest with you. I think that it, what they're doing, you're just going to get the same thing out of someone like Carter Mazur. I'd rather see Carter Mazur be utilized than Valeno and Bear Green taking up those, those spots, essentially, at this point. But this team right now, Derek, offensively, is a train wreck, I would say, to be brutally honest with you. I think a lot of people would agree with me on that. A lot of people probably think the defense blows as well. I don't think the defense really has been as bad, or at least the Simon Evanson and Mo Sider pairing, but goaltending has been astounding. Um, yeah. Do you have anything else that you want to talk about on what's working or what's not real quick before we move along to our final thoughts and end this episode for our viewers, fans, watchers, listeners alike? No, oh, man, we do got about 20 minutes till puck drop for this Edmonton game, but I mean, you're right. What, one of the biggest gripes I have right now is that Gustafsson. It's like we brought him in to be that power play specialist to connect with Kane and Cat out there because we've seen in the past how well they did together. But obviously, the past the past now. A man can barely even take a slap shot without missing the puck. Like, Jesus Christ, the man was yeah, known man. for that cannon he had, and now he's just whipping on every one-timer. He can't put anything on net. The man with a healthy scratch after the first game, even it's like, if that doesn't show you what's happening, it's pretty out there in the world. And as I look at our text message, as Carlos blowing us up as he's trying to help his brother move in, he's actually uh, looking like he's switching a little bit on the newsy side a little bit. But I feel like that's because of a line changeup that's happening tonight. So we're gonna we're gonna see how that goes for us. But it's. I feel like it really comes down to that coaching aspect right now. Like, I need someone to light a fire under Derek Lone's butt so he can light fires underneath this team's butt. Because he, like we said, with that Marchand problem, not even a problem, the Marchand ordeal, where he literally said, this is what a coach is supposed to do. He's pretty much putting me on my place. Showing me that I need to do this. I know I'm supposed to do this. I know I'm capable of doing this. And that's what we need Derek Lowen to remind these players of. We have probably some of the, literally one of the best American-born players on our team right now with one goal. Is that his own fault? No. But we also have other players that are just blowing assignments nonstop. Like we have Pat, almost said Patrick, we have to bring it out there, missing open nets. Literally, I, I can't get I can't get away from the cap problem. Obviously, he has four goals. It's not bad on the season, but at the same time, he should probably have eight with how many chances he's had. Yeah. Like yeah. there's a lot of issues going forward right now, but at the same time, we I feel like they I, can't be fixed. I'll give it I'll give it credit as credit's due. We're still early in the season-ish. So there is these issues that we see right now is they can be fixed, but if they still persist by say, I'll give it Thanksgiving, which is usual cutoff deadline for any teams who want to make the playoffs. But at the same time, we saw that last year where the Red Wings were in a good spot. And we, yeah, yeah, it happens the last two years now. So I'm not getting any hopes up on that. But I feel like that has to be a hard deadline, at least for Stevie Y in the front office saying, like, okay, if we don't see some spark in the team, understanding of what they need to do some reassignments that actually work, it's really going to fall on Newsy's head really fast and really hard, especially in his last year that he has with us under his contract. Yeah, and just to kind of add on to it before we end here, yeah, I think this team, honestly, Derek, just to add on to it, I know we talked about coaching, but I think a lot, I think 
probably majority of everyone outside of the top line and Simon Edmondson and Cider, they're trying to outplay what they actually can produce for this team. Like I said, I called out Christian Fisher. He's made he made quite a few horrible decisions the last game. There was quite a few number of passes. I think you you mentioned that they're trying to do too much fancy stuff, right? So they're trying to outplay what they actually can do. If this team and Derek Lalone can figure it out and tell these boys play to your ability the best you can, don't try to outplay what you can't do. We're going to see success and hopefully more shots on that by doing that. And like you said, this team just does not look the fastest compared to last season, which is super weird because you really didn't make too much changes. But we're not exactly the youngest team either. We're one of the more oldest teams in the league now, technically. So, uh, yeah, there's still plenty of time left in this season, but I would agree with you. By Come Thanksgiving, it might not be a pretty conversation between Iserman and Lalone, but a lot of people, I can't say a lot of people, but there are some people out there that think Lalone has a pretty long leash on him because he is Iserman's choice. So we'll just have to wait and see. But the more this continues, I don't know how much longer you can give it or else my prediction is going to, or my hot take's going to be correct where we're a bottom 10 team in the league. I'd rather not go back to that spot. That was many years ago, and we still won't get anywhere near a first-round pick. So <laughs> we can be the last-place team, and we will get the eighth pick overall somehow. So don't go there, Red Wings. Please don't go there. The league hates At that us. Point, I'd be okay with that. Maybe they could trade it for a ready-now player. Who knows? But, yeah, I agree with you. All right, Derek, I think we can end it from here. We've recorded for quite a bit. And, yes, the Red Wings will be taking on the Edmonton Oilers today. We are recording before that game. So, Derek, honestly, I think the Red Wings are going to lose, so I'm just going to say it flat out. So, next episode, we really don't have to do too much coverage on this, but what do you think? And you can go ahead and talk about your uh, final thoughts too, buddy. Final thoughts. Uh, let's. Boys, light a fire in your butts. Get that competitiveness. Know your skills. Know what you're good at. Be capable of what you're doing out there. I just want to see the boys do what they can, and we should be okay. We won't be the greatest team in the league, but we'll be a competitive team. That's what I want to see out there. And if we're going to go into tonight's game, I'm going to call it a 3-1 to one victory for the Red Wings. Casper gets his first goal. Raymond gets one, and Debrinka gets one. Let's okay. go. All right. You're a little more optimistic than I am. Although the Edmonton Oilers do have Calvin Picard in that, so the Red Wings should have decent opportunities of putting the puck into the net. But how many opportunities are they going to get to put the puck onto the net is the better question. So for me, I think I'm going to go with Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl. I think Zach Hyman gets gets a goal. I think he's still goalless, actually. I'm not sure. I do have him in fantasy, so I should know that. But um, yeah, I believe that it's probably going to be closer to like, I think it's going to actually be the same as Buffalo. I think it's going to be five to three. It's going to be a little higher scoring, but I think the Red Wings walk away with an L on this one, personally. But Derek did his final thoughts. Those aren't exactly my final thoughts are, but my final thoughts are, let's go Red Wings. I hope we absolutely win. And before we go ahead and end this episode, why don't you go ahead and take a second. If you are still around watching this episode, why don't you go ahead and hit that subscribe button and hit that like button. If you are on YouTube, if you are on Spotify or on Apple, go ahead and hit that follow button and rate us the five stars. It truly does help us out. And doing all those things are free, Derek. I'm not sure if you knew that or not. Oh, really? Why am I paying for all this stuff? Oh, wait, I'm just paying you half the time. That's right. For friendship fees. And with that, we'll see y'all on the next one. See ya. Bye, y'all.